Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the co-facilitators for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments. And I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Young, many of you know, waving. <laughs> And Stella Larman, as Eva mentioned, is uh, the person who interprets all these materials in, into Spanish slides and, and handouts, and also um, does live interpretation, which Gisela Carrasco is also doing for both um, the, um, the core events and here today for the qu your questions and comments in the chat, which means feel free to pose your questions in English or Spanish, and Gisela will take care of translating them either way. And I'll turn it over to um, Eva and Sarah to introduce themselves. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. Happy to be here. Uh, my name is Eva Holt-Rustmore, and I'm the program coordinator for DataShare Santa Cruz County. And I'm joined uh, here by Sarah. Do you want to say hi, Sarah? Hi, my name is Sarah Adler, um, and I am a web analyst at DataShare. Great, thanks. Um, Eva, did you want to do a quick data share? Yeah, and then we'll go into the results menu. Love it. Great. So um, I'll just say quickly a few things about data share for those who are less familiar um, with uh, data share, Santa Cruz County. Um, data share is a shared platform that has uh, the central information and most up-to-date data and reports um, with community well-being indicators um, that help tell the story of our community strengths and gaps. Um, it serves multiple purposes, um, just like there's multiple uh, people here um, with different needs from uh, data sets. Uh, the platform is uh, very versatile. And you can um, use the main tools on the platform, as we'll be doing in today's exercises, um, to do reports, look at local progress, um, see which data is most important for your work and your purpose, and create dashboards. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about data share today, because we have some meat to get into that I think will tell its own story. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to give everybody a quick tour of the core results menu on DataShare, which you may already be familiar with. Um, so the way to get to it is to go to the local progress tab and click on core results menu. So there are, there are other ways, but that's the easy way. And then if you, there's an overview of all the core conditions and the core vision, mission, and values. But if you scroll down, you'll see some tools that we can talk about as well. But here is the core results menu. And for each of the core conditions, there are eight of them, there are um, four impact areas that you'll see. So today we're going to talk about the four that are here in health and wellness. And you'll have a chance to go into a smaller breakout group and um, explore each of these in more detail. But the way that you get to the detail is simply by clicking on it. And then you'll see a variety of more detailed indicators and data, as well as occasionally something like data unavailable at this time. So there's lots more on data share and on the core results menu than we're covering in each of these, um, these glimpses. And we wanted to let you know that this was the, what's represented on the core results menu is the is part of a process, a long process of vetting and trying to find some indicators that really illustrate the impact we could have in each of these areas of core conditions. There are always going to be um, data points that are variable or missing or could be more robust. And that's part of the data world. So there have been a lot of improvements over the last several years since DataShare was first launched in 2019, but there are also um, a ways to go. And so what we wanna urge everyone today is not to get so hung up on necessarily how current or robust a particular piece is. This is trying to paint a portrait that will get um, more clear over time but to really have an opportunity to talk about what the data might tell us in terms of a story. So flaws, gaps, and all, 
how can we use the data that are currently on data share and are curated on the results menu as a springboard for discussing what we can all do as a community to contribute to equitable health and well being for everyone in our county. And while today we're focusing on the health and wellness core condition and the indicators contained within that, there are future sessions like this one that will be devoted to the other core conditions. We always wanna remind everyone that we see these as interconnected. So while the health and wellness ones might have some health specific data, they are of course relevant to economic stability, to housing, to um, education and to thriving families and community connectedness and all of the core conditions have portions of them that are either tightly or loosely bound to the other ones. So keep that in mind as well as we discuss them. What we are hoping to do today is to spend the bulk of our time in smaller groups discussing together um, one of the four impact areas under health and wellness. You'll have a chance to choose which room you'd like to join. One group will stay with me in the main room and we'll record that session um, in English and Spanish. The other three groups will only be in English without a recording. So we'll try and keep at least one group recorded if somebody wants to watch this um, other than the live session. When you get to your breakout group, you'll do a round of introductions and then select someone to report back to our larger group. And each group will have a member of the core or data share team to sort of walk us through some questions that you'll see in the chat. And I'll, I'm gonna go back to the core results menu to, uh, to show you a little more about each indicator area so you can choose which group is most interesting to you today. And actually, Nicole, everyone's been assigned to a group. Oh, that's right. I, I apologize. Yes, everyone's been assigned. So you'll you'll see um, the data here. And just let me go back to the. So there, there, the four groups are the equitable access to affordable quality care, the one I just gave you a glimpse of. Then there's appropriate utilization of care and then behaviors that maintain or improve health and optimal health status. And so when we click on each of these in each of your small groups, so for example, if you were in the appropriate utilization of care one, you would see some, some data about prenatal care, preventative care and screening, um, some data that the, the core vetting process thought would be important to track, but isn't yet available in the format that people thought would be useful. So we're, we're ha we have placeholders for those. But what we're gonna do is pick one of these um, that we have worked on before to, show, to illustrate how you can use some of these data to answer some of the questions. And you can see some um, questions will be posed in the chat and your facilitators in the small groups will walk us through them. So any questions before we dive in? So when we get to the groups, we're gonna talk about the story that the selected indicator tells us about our community's strengths or needs or root causes and any differences that we see in those data about um, well-being outcomes based on anything that can be disaggregated by race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, geographic area, or any other equity dimension. And again, just a reminder, these aren't all available for all indicators, but we're gonna use what we do have to have that conversation and discussion. And then we're gonna explore the different layers or dimensions that we see embedded in that indicator. No right or wrong answers, really just reactions to what you're seeing. So what do you see as the, um, the options for, for us as a community? Are we creating the local conditions that, that help people thrive? And are we doing that in an equitable, fair fashion? What are the local conditions that we might be able to influence or change? And how can we build on the data that we do have to measure change, learn what works, and assess the impact that we have. So that's what we're gonna be up to once we get to our small groups. 
And we have 30 minutes to do this and then we'll come back and report. Um, we, we were really curious about um, kind of a, a comparison around um, resource map of, um, of access to resources, proximity and use. Um, and um, we, we're curious also just about the data source and um, you know, how many people are we counting and what does that look like in comparison um, to the uh, county overall? Um, so those were some of the, the basic thoughts that came out. And Cindy, if you wanna add um, any gaps there, I would appreciate it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, we saw some, um, some variation across um, locations within the county. So that, that seems to be really helpful to a lot of folks in our, in our group, um, seeing um, disaggregated data uh, according to location in the county. Um, we noticed that the um, San Lorenzo um, had, um, and uh, the difference between two parts of the county, South County and San Lorenzo was, um, a large one and wondering if we could get, um, I guess, understand more if that's a significant difference um, across uh, the different locations within the county. Um, let's see, um, it was noted that um, there's, we should perhaps look at the resources and distribution across the county, um, as Evan mentioned, um, and one thing that really came up that was interesting was the housing stock. So how does the housing stock factor in to outcomes, health outcomes, like the distribution of um, housing for uh, seniors being more concentrated in South County and how, how would that affect then the, the, the figures that would we would observe uh, across the different locations. Um, so we, we talked a lot about that and, and um, 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 and other things too. <laughs> and so it, was, it just seemed very helpful to different people in the group in terms of um, this la layer, these layers of information. Right. Thanks, Eva and Cindy. How about group three? Crystal is going to do our report out for us. Yes, thank you. Hey, everyone. So our group looked at healthy behaviors, and we specifically looked at adults who walk regularly, which for anyone who works with me, that's what I look at. I do healthy eating, active living. Um, so we found that, you know, we looked at the data. We found overall that Santa Cruz County adults walk regularly on average more. We're doing better than the California average. So if you look at that data, it's pretty much green. And then if you break down by zip code, we see disparities among zip codes in Santa Cruz County with more walkers being more in the Northern County regions and uh, less walking rates in the South County. Although only differing by a couple percentage points. Again, like we talked about, but that's displayed like green where the high walking rates are and red where the lower walking rates are. And we talked about how the colors themselves uh, spark storytelling in our own minds. And it's important to think more about that before we make conclusions. Um, we talked about the importance of thinking about other elements and indicators that aren't represented in what we see on data share. So thinking about the built environment, work schedules, you know, leisure time, um, whether wa the walking itself is related to leisure walking or walking to work, commuting, school. Um, none of that's uh, illustrated in the data we were looking at. Um, the question was also adults who walk more than 150 minutes per week, which is quite a bit of walking. Um, <clears throat> and again, depending on who's walking and why and, and where you're going. And overall, we said, I think one of the conclusions was, while it looks, it's a little bit dangerous and we need to be careful because it, it looks like it, compared to the rest of the state, we're doing well, but that we need to make sure that that doesn't um, feed into inaction or thinking we're doing okay on that front because we're still, we still have over half of adults not walking uh, at least 150 minutes per week, which that's a lot. 
And um, even though we are green compared to the rest of the state, we need to dive into that more. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, sounds like a great discussion and lots of, lots of layers to that. What about group two? I think uh, Najib has offered to report back on our group. All right, good morning. Um, let's see, so we, 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 had a, we had a good discussion um, on impact number two, which is the appropriate utilization of care. So we went through um, some of the indicators like early prenatal care. And we also looked at colon cancer screening and, you know, one of the, there's a few kind of major talking points that came up in our group. Um, one was the data lag, because we were looking at um, early prenatal care and looking at the breakout based on zip codes, but that was from 2012. Um, so, you know, there's some information there that we can utilize. Um, to kind of guide our thinking in terms of what we want to do around policies, you know, target group, um, and hoping that, you know, um, some of that data gets updated. And I think um, Sarah talked about that that's the plan. Um, and then, you know, we also talked about kind of the policies that could potentially be or, or practices that we could potentially um, uh, put in place uh, one of the things we're looking at, you know, in terms of early prenatal care is we know in the pandemic, people have lost jobs, which has led to loss of health care. So, you know, maybe there's um, some work that needs to be done around outreach so that populations and communities know about what they may be eligible for, like Medi-Cal, if they had some other type of health insurance before. Um, you know, some of our programs, whether it's the nonprofit or the county uh, focusing on specific zip codes because we see that there's, you know, you know, less utilization or access to prenatal care. So there's a lot of things that we can do to kind of think about, you know, how do we um, address kind of where the gaps are. Um, and then, you know, there was all, we also had a good discussion about um, just the use of data share and how it could be, you know, potentially helpful for nonprofits who may not have the data capacity um, or, and the tools to, to, to kind of collect that specific type of data. Um, the, it can also be utilized for grant writing. Um, and then the other kind of piece about that was also like, you know, our nonprofits have data that isn't here on data share. So how can we make that connection um, and collect some of that data that uh, is valuable and helpful, um, but isn't necessarily, you know, accessible on data share. Um, and so, and, and then, you know, kind of similar to what a couple of groups said about, you know, what are some of those other indicators that can have, you know, an impact on um, like early prenatal care or just, you know, healthy babies um, and healthy families kind of going back to the collective impact, what are some of those other indicators that we could be looking into and, and adding? Um, so I think that's kind of the summary of our discussion in our group. Thank you, Najib. Um, that also sounds like a very rich multi-layered discussion. So in our group, we looked at, in group one, we looked at the equitable access to affordable quality care and specifically looked at people who have a usual source of health care and were able to dive into um, some data that pulled out the race and ethnicity comparisons. And as some of you have mentioned in the other groups, for this particular indicator, um, the Black and African American population in Santa Cruz has um, much less reported usual source of care, only about a third of uh, Black African American residents report that compared to 90% overall. So that overall number, um, which looks good compared to other California counties, um, potentially is masking a, a real disparity there. And so we talked about how that was 
highlighted in um, a data spotlight on data share and some other ways. And it also had an asterisk on it about the value being statistically unstable potentially, and that it, therefore it should be interpreted with caution. We were guessing that that was because it's a small number, um, but we don't know for sure. So we had some discussion about how do you find that out? Uh, we, we veered into some other topics about that. Um, is that related to, um, are there, is there potential for outreach and education about connecting to a source of care? What are some of the other barriers that are, are preventing that? Um, we were curious about the geography and zip codes. It wasn't available for that indicator. So we went hunting into another, uh, another realm, another another impact area and set of indicators to look at some maps. We talked about um, some links to other core conditions, particularly housing, which came up in some of the other groups as well. And um, just, just generally tried to understand um, both the limitations and the value of what's already on data share in terms of this kind of discussion about what, what does it tell us, what, where could we go next? Um, so those of you who are in group one, does anybody want to add anything I've missed in that recap? Okay, group one's being quiet. <laughs> Cindy, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Oops. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so something that came up in our, our discussion too is um, was the um, um, wondering about the number of folks in 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 um, different groups? So we did look um, at the race ethnicity um, disaggregation, and we found there was a um, I think it was one group. We, we was had a there was a large there was a not basically it was a lot very large number <laughs> compared to the others and so we were wondering if you know how many people were in that sample and like in in your group as well that seemed to come up um, um so um so how do we look at these figures and understand them if the groups that we're looking at maybe constitute a very small number within the study, within that research. And it may be helpful to go back into the American Community Survey or the source data and see, oh yeah, that, that was a very small number that participated. But in some ways, marginal groups will not be represented very well in this kind of structural data um, that's collected by, you know, <laughs> Um, so yeah. it's so a good point, Cindy. Yeah. And in the case of group one's data, that was from the California Health Interview Survey, which is a phone survey, and there are all kinds of issues with that, as we all know. Um, but so some of the ways around that might be um, some oversampling when there are local, um, local surveys or interviews maybe particular organizations, um, as was mentioned, as Najib mentioned, might be collecting their own mm -hmm. information that's um, more, more solid, more useful, and has a, a better representation um, of different groups. And that's part of why the Black Health Matters group did a data spotlight on that small population, just because of the, the lack of data and trying to um, I think their tagline was making the invisible visible. So um, there are lots of ways that we can, even in the absence of some of these data sets, try to have a better understanding of what, what we're learning and what's going on there. Yeah, so, so another thing, idea that came up in, in our group was that um, bringing the data back to communities. So bringing mm -hmm. the data back and, and trying to engage in conversation of why this is happening, what what are some ideas about how we can address it, you know. So the some of the, you know, going back and getting some information from our our community. Um, so that, that may be uh, one way to address and the another way might be as well that came up in another group I think that you mentioned was to bring in other indicators. So it seemed like it was uh, really hard to make a story 
to, to look at the story as one of the questions asked um, using one indicator. So um, mm -hmm. how do we incorporate other indicators in to maybe fill out that story, make a richer story with, you know, uh, with more information, see what patterns there may be. So those are some. Yeah, others. it's a great point. Yeah, and then, none of these are in isolation, um, just like the core conditions aren't themselves. Great, any other um, insights? Thoughts sparked by this exercise, ways that you think you might use these in your own settings? Everybody needs another espresso? <laughs> well, I'm conscious of our time. Oh, go ahead, Ray. I see your hand up. Thank you. I think I think the one thing that was more most helpful was just having a lot of other data people talk about an issue because there's just so many variables and multivariate um, reasons why outcomes might be the reason you're seeing on a survey. And I really feel like the discussions in the subgroups when you are diving into data and having and, and pressing like pressing lightly on on some outcomes or or people's already like resulted outcomes based on, on certain data sources, it helps further the conversation to clarity as to what actions one should take to help address whatever, uh, you know, in particular outcome you're trying to reach. And so, you know, I, I think that for me, what I keep getting back to is, you know, we can all have our theory of change, but having other people um, almost peer review your theory of change and ask questions from an inquisitory place is really helpful to gain clarity um and i just don't think we have enough spaces to do so um you know outside of these working groups yep here here that's music to our ears um big big believers in that that use of theories of change just to um, test your assumptions and see what what other reactions are and so that's great great feedback and also what we had hoped would happen today in these discussions so and you're getting some some of that in the chat as well. So thanks for bringing that up. Keith, how about you? I see your hand up. Yeah, I'm gonna just uh, ask a quick question. Um, with the concern, um, like I've seen, and this, this is not just with the black African-American population, it's concerning to me in general, but being black and African-American as well. Um, and I know I've had a hard time getting data on say veterans who are black and African-American yes. in the homeless population, which is, you know, disparity be there how am how or who do i talk to to try to you know do more like i've never been surveyed or talked to or anything i've been here for five years and, mm -hmm. um, just who do i got to get that discussion further to help contribute to some outreach uh, and such because just with say the homeless and veteran population they are not necessarily maybe the point in time count some of the african-american homeless are not at say the bench lands or whatever, that little scattered site to sort of contribute with that. Yeah, Keith, I, I would suggest, I think Keisha Browder has been really involved in the Black Health Matters um, and putting together that data spotlight at, at United Way. Um, so that might be a great place to start. And I, I don't know if others on the call have some suggestions for Keith. All right, well, well, we'll, if you do have ideas after this session, let us know and we'll, we'll make sure we get those to Keith, but um, that would be one place to start. Thank you, Keith, for the question and the comment. Anything else before I turn it over to Eva to close us out? Ray, is that your hand again? For, yeah, I think, I, think the one, I think the one thing that I also uh, struggle with and something that I think is, is worth discussing further is um, when we have, you know, so many needs, finite resources, that it inevitably comes to, um, you know, impacting as many people as possible. Um, but in doing so, in that philosophy, sometimes uh, marginalized or unrepresented communities get left out. Um, but at the same time, there has to be a fine balance between, you know, um, you know, you know, the, the, the concept of raising all boats 
or being specific uh, around identifying um, targeted populations. So I, I think that, you know, I don't have clarity or an answer. It's more of a question of, of how do we balance this to and what strategies could we um, look to, uh, to to find a, a good balance? Because uh, both of those have pros and cons in, in both of the philosophies. And, and um, I think it's just a discussion point. Absolutely. It's something that our community is not alone in struggling with. Darlene, thanks for the comment about learning so much today. That was the goal. And so we appreciate that. And we encourage all of you to, to keep exploring. Um, there's always uh, new, new ways to um, not just look at this information, but to try to make sense of it and really appreciate the, the suggestions about doing so in small groups, because that really can bring some different perspectives to bear. And we can always use that. So I'll turn it over to Eva. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. And thank you, everyone. Um, I know I learned a lot from my uh, breakout group as well. So thanks. Um, I think. Um, I think you all summarized um, insights from the groups pretty well um, for us to take back, just thinking about how, how are we also tracking and measuring um, resource um, and resources and, um, and thinking about that and the impact of that on um, the data that we see around health and well-being. Um, what kind of data sources are we integrating into uh, the platform and how can we be more expansive um, so that we're integrating um, the local data that tells uh, a story that helps us make more sense of the current data? Um, how are we thinking about um, our local nonprofits and um, services um, and uh, their role in this piece? Um, and really the role of discussion and feedback in understanding what the data says. Um, and, um, and the last piece around that um, is kind of this, um, this constant need to really get community feedback on uh, thinking, thinking about data points as an important part of the story, but then who is the person behind that data point? Um, so those are the... Um, kind of the, the basic um, insight list that um, that I got from everyone. Thank you so much. Um, it's great that uh, people liked the discussion part because this is actually the first uh, part of a six part series of discussions like this based around the core conditions um, to really hold um, hold the discussions in place. So um, we don't have a next set update, but um, it will be in a couple of months for the next discussion to follow up on this one. Um, and I know that some of you had questions about the platform use and um, some kind of more specific technical questions. So um, please uh, follow up with us. Um, we'll send out some responses um, for the questions that we received um, already. But if anything come else comes Thumbs up, please let us know. Um, and does anyone have anything else they would like to add? Let's keep filling out the feedback survey. We do we do pay close attention to it. So thank you.